Thank you all for coming. It's a great pleasure to speak here today. Um, what I'd like to show you is some of our work in learning-based control, which was just mentioned. But let me begin by putting this in the bigger picture. So we all share the vision that we'd like to advance autonomy in many challenging applications to increase their efficiency, their sustainability, our human well-being. And we've seen a number of examples in the talks before of what we'd like to achieve. Control lies at the heart of an autonomous system governs its automatic decision-making, but the classical techniques that we have, they're just not suited to address these problems. Why? Because they're very complex, there's lots of uncertainty, variation, there's human interaction. And so, as was mentioned before, our research tries to develop the methods that underlie these and allow control systems to now leverage the potential of learning and adaptation to advance autonomy in these much more challenging problems. We've seen quite some progress in learning-based control over the last years, many of which demonstrated in robotics. However, what I believe remains to be a major difficulty is to be able to learn in the real world. And I'd like to focus on this, and in particular, talk about two main challenges that we address. The first one is that of safety. So when we're learning in a control system, then we're directly closing the loop around the learning. A learned action has both an immediate and long-term consequence, and in the real system, we have to avoid making critical mistakes. So here, we formulate safety as the presence of a set of safety constraints that always have to be satisfied, which is a rather general formulation. The second challenge is that of efficiency. Our controllers run in real time on very limited hardware, so we have to be very efficient with our computations. In addition, we have to be data efficient. We often do not have lots of data for one particular system that we're running. In addition, if we want to collect data, that means running an experiment, and that's very resource intensive. So we want to be very smart and make most of the data that we collect. So I'd like to argue that in view of these two goals, the use of models and optimization offers significant benefits. And hopefully I can convince you of that in the next 10 minutes. One model and optimization-based approach that's seen a lot of success in practice, also in robotics, is model predictive control. So what happens here is that we use a dynamics model, so a description of how the system behaves depending on the actions, to compute a trajectory forward that optimizes our control goal. This allows us to directly impose the safety constraints, and we can also account for actuator limitations. And then we resolve that planning problem at every sampling time. You see that here for our demonstration platform, autonomous racing with small race cars, supposed to be an affordable platform that you can use to test your techniques. It's developed by Andrea Caron. We've now made all of this open source, the hardware, the software, and if you'd like to see it in action, please come visit us at the exhibition later in the afternoon. Okay, so optimization allows us to systematically address the safety constraints. And now we can combine this with learning to address some of the main difficulties of this approach. And this is to come up with good models of the dynamics, but also of the objective that reflects the goals that we'd like to achieve. Now, if we're learning, if we're using learning for this, I think two aspects are important. So we have to run the system to collect the data. So I think we have to rely on our fundamental system and problem understanding first, and then augment that with the data. So we use what we know, and then we learn the rest. We will always have limited data. So if we're working with models, then we will have residual model uncertainty. And if we want to be thinking about safety, then we have to take this into account. One modeling approach that's seen quite some popularity in the last years is the use of a Gaussian process. Why? It's a very general model, it's non-parametric, it's ideally suited to capture all of these complex effects that we have a hard time modeling. In addition, it allows us to express the residual model uncertainty. Plus, it's been shown to work very well in practice. And here you see some examples, a couple of which of our own work, for example, for the robot arm and the autonomous racing. So we have seen that improving the model online allows us to really push the performance. Why are these not used everywhere? because they're very computationally expensive. And here, we've now started to really make a major step by starting to develop tailored optimization methods for these techniques, and we're doing that in an EU project together with Moritz Steel and Freiburg. Our recently proposed approach computes now a suboptimal solution 
but 1,000 times faster. And to give you some numbers for these miniature race cars, we can now compute this in 5.5 milliseconds, so a predictive controller that launched the model online. And this really brings us into a range where we can start pushing this into many ex applications, which is an exciting moment. So we're able to learn a model, but how do we do that efficiently? And there's two aspects to this. One is that we should be thinking about which data we're collecting. We, our controller can address also the problem of exploitation, exp, uh, exploitation, exploitation. We can decide which information to collect. If we're doing that episodically, then this has been addressed in reinforcement learning. But if we actually learn online, then this is a hard problem. It's a hard problem of dual control, so simultaneously identifying and controlling a system. The second aspect, and I'd like to focus on that now, is to leverage related data. We often don't have a lot of information about one particular system, but a related system, a related environment. So how do we leverage this? We can frame this as a problem of multitask learning. We've seen a number of tasks, and now what we'd like to do is to extract from that data the task structure, the commonalities in order to then be able to quickly adapt when we're seeing a new task. We've looked at the theory of this, but also an application together with Marco Hutter's group and the Robotic Systems Lab for robotic manipulation, in particular experiments door, door opening with the quadrupedal manipulator. So think about the problem that you have already opened a number of tasks, and now you want to quickly adapt at the moment when you have to open a new door. We're not using a Gaussian process because we want it to be very computationally efficient, but we use an approximate parametric model that relies on trigonometric basis functions. So the idea now is that these basis functions, they capture the task structure, whereas the combinations make this task specific. So what we adapt online is the combinations, and that can be done very efficiently, whereas the basis functions are optimized offline in a multitask sense. And I'd like to show you some examples here. We have the nominal MPC that does not adapt and therefore cannot achieve the new task, whereas the multitask MPC quickly adapts and also nicely and smoothly rejects any disturbances. Comparing this then with single task learning, what we see is that we have much smoother behavior because we do not overfit to a particular um, task data set. So this is one way of learning a controller. There's many others, and we've now also spent quite some time thinking about a general framework that allows us to augment your desired controller with a safety guarantee. This makes sense for reinforcement learning. They often don't have this property, but you could also have some other policy, maybe even a human pilot or um, a human controller. So we only get to see the desired action. We don't know the underlying policy, and we, what we need to do is to verify if that, if that input is safe to apply, and otherwise, we have to modify it. And we call that a safety filter. Now, safety now means that we want to keep the system safe for all times. And this is exactly where an understanding of the dynamics and the model is very important. It's not enough to just look at the constraints now, you might still be within your constraints, but the dynamics are such that you cannot keep the system safe going forward. And you already have to prevent that um, and apply a safety ensuring action. So this problem has been investigated in the context of readability, readability analysis. Control barrier functions are quite popular. But if you think about how I just explained this problem to you, you also realize that this is a predictive planning problem. Verifying if some action is safe comes down to planning a safe forward trajectory. We cannot plan for infinite time, so we plan finite time and make sure we land in a domain from which onwards we know that safety is fine. We can write that down as an optimization problem, very similar to what we had before, but now there's no performance objective. We're just trying to match the, the, the given control action as closely as possible subject to finding a safe trajectory, which does not have to be able to complete the task. It just needs to be safe. This makes this approach very scalable to complex problems, and you now have a modular approach that allows you to just plug this into your, your control system. 
you're keeping your favorite learning controller, and this guarantees the safety constraints. You can see this here for the miniature cars. We have a human pilot just pushing the car left or right, or not steering at all. The safety filter keeps this on track all the time. The PhD student who had worked on this has then joined Bosch Research, and they have now started to put this on their test vehicle. And here you see a video. So it's quite exciting to see that these ideas and techniques are today also moving into industry. At this point, let me summarize. What I was trying to convey, so I think there is a lot to gain from models and optimization-based methods to create safe and efficient learning-based control methods. I've shown you techniques for doing efficient online learning and predictive control, both achieving computational and data efficiency. And I've also shown you this idea of a general safety framework that you can use to augment any other learning method to get the safety guarantee. Again, if we want to use models, then I think we have to address the model uncertainty. And the entire sort of second track of our research is to rigorously think about robust, stochastic, constrained control methods, which I did not have time to talk about today. At this point, let me thank the current and the former team members who've made this possible and develop all these exciting results, as well as the funding agencies and then I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm now looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Melanie, for this very important message. We have a few minutes for questions. Please raise your hand very high so that people can see you. There is a question over there. Hi, good morning, and thank you for an interesting presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding the learning-based control approaches because when it turns into a product and then maybe you reach its scenarios and you want to investigate the resale, the root cause of it, is this problem solved or investigated also in your research or is it still a problem? Um, so if I understand your question correctly, then you're asking, um, if you now run the system and there is a failure, how do you take this information into account? Is that correct? Yeah, I would say if there is uh, undesired behavior. Undes so, yes. yeah. Um, well, obviously, I mean, with this, um, you can also uh, try to learn from that information. But I think the key message that I tried to convey is that significant failures would not be allowed. So we would go the other way around, we start operating maybe conservatively, and then as we collect more information about the system, you allow yourself to explore more and more. Uh, and we wouldn't be doing it the other way around. We have uh, two questions in the front here. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. And I wanted to ask, how do you think the uh, generalization of this would be in an instructional environment? Because doing models in an instructional environment is more or less easy, depending on your environment. But deploying this on, for example, trees and stuff like that, will this be possible with these models? Or do you think it's not really feasible in the future? And so the question is to, uh, to move this into uh, industry, is that or...? Uh, in industry or just in like a unstructured environment, like for example the streets or... Okay, now I have the mic again. Um, thank you for the question. So, of course, there's assumptions that we're making, right? Um, if you have an unstructured environment and there's changes that you cannot foresee, um, then you can only do your best effort. We also look at methods that do this. Um, so if you cannot satisfy constraints, 
you have to relax them in some sense, but what is your best effort that ultimately allows you to get back into safe operation? So I think these kind of ideas are then becoming very important because, of course, if my constraints change arbitrarily, right, or my dynamics change arbitrarily, then I have to rework my formulation in order to make this work. So I, I, I think we are looking at that, but of course, um, there's going to be some fundamental limits to when you can prove safety. We have time to, for just one last question. We're going to take this one on the left-hand side. You may want to take the mic, just give the person a second. Just a quick question. In your slides, you have the, the cars. Um, do you, did you also look at other applications? Um, yes, so we, <laughs> I usually show the cars because they're our demonstration platform to test a number of things. Um, we are always looking for partners to move these things into, into practice and into other exciting applications. We've worked with you know, some of our colleagues, we've worked with our industry partners, um, but yes, we're very excited to discuss um, if you have ideas for other applications. All right, thank you very much. We'll thank Melanie again and we'll continue.